Merci beaucoup Marion. Bonjour à tous. Thank you very much Marion. Yes, hello. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, first of all I'd like to thank the director of Aguerre for having invited me here and all the Aguerre group. Well, this morning I in fact was able to visit the premises and I'd like to say to you that I'm absolutely impressed and uh, I really admire what the Aguerre group does and represents and the way indeed that it uh, manages its employees and works with its partners. And today, I think that this makes us uh, think of uh, German and French unity and also, in fact, makes us realize that it's only together that we can achieve great projects. Nobody can achieve anything alone, of course. We have to work hand in hand. And indeed, uh, that's uh, the conclusion I uh, get after my little visit of the premises this morning. So once again, bravo. And indeed, as uh, Marianne said, said I went to the United States when I was 17 years old in order to uh, study uh, communication uh, studies. I obtained a master's in communication. And in fact, I wanted to become a director. Now, the theme this week is uh, creativity. I'll dwell on my own personal life history a little later. But personally, I would say that for most of us, creativity is something, in fact, which is circumscribed by codes and fashions and trends. In fact, if we think about our past, in architecture, we have uh, observed uh, trends and codes and fashions. At the time of the kings with different styles under Louis the 14th, the 15th and the 16th again in the world of architecture, uh, if we think about interior design, um, the design of fashion or indeed furniture uh, with uh, clothes. Uh, when it comes to thought or art. And little by little, we evolved and we moved on to Art Deco or Art, uh, uh, art Nouveau, and we were really surrounded by these codes. Now, certain people, in fact, tried to dismantle these codes, to break them in various areas. I'm thinking about the advent of the Beatles in the music sector. This was something which was totally revolutionary in the 60s, or again, in the area of architecture architecture, people like Le Corbusier, who started uh, to uh, build these functional buildings, uh, bringing together people from various backgrounds. And again, for the very first time, um, uh, people started building uh, shops or working areas or uh, spaces for residents. And then there was Frank Lloyd Wright in the United States uh, in the sector, in the architectural sector. <laughs> So, different codes, as I say, and artists like Picasso, who again uh, really broke codes in, in art and painting, and slowly and gradually we realized that various individuals, through their creativity, took things one step further and dared to do things differently. Needless to say, as always, when people do things differently, that draws criticism. People look at you askance. And these people, in fact, were skillful enough and clever enough to continue and uh, to become well-known. And without uh, them, we wouldn't have everything we have today with these people who dared, who dared to do. There's something I like in the United States when one says, shoot for the stars and you might uh, fall on the moon. And and uh, I very much like that uh, motto, and I believe that is what creativity is all about. I'd like to remind you about something else. In creativity, there's also an element of uh, dream, dreaming, uh, which we've seen in science fiction, in books, in cartoons. And uh, what these uh, characters uh, dreamt of, their fantasies, well, today, if you look at uh, cartoons or uh, you read science fiction books, well, 
it's no longer science fiction. On the contrary, we see that in uh, television shows or films, but things have in fact come about. Connected worlds, interconnected worlds. We used to read about that when we were children, and we never would have imagined that that would happen, but it exists today. Even the little telephones on which we can uh, communicate and see each other for, from one side of the earth to the other, well, we would never have imagined that in the past. And why? Well, thanks to people who dared to dream, who tried to reach out for the stars, and who came and produced things that we would never have imagined possible. And very often in French we say impossible is not French. And I like the fact that in France today, and again in Germany, of course, people, innovative people, uh, are uh, achieving this and proving to us uh, that uh, impossible, well, that's not French, it's not European. Now, personally, I uh, uh, started working for the advertising uh, sector in the USA. When I went to the United States, I wanted to, in fact, work as a director, but I didn't want to be a small pawn in this uh, large uh, uh, sector. And so I turned to advertising, advertising connected to fashion, and uh, again I encountered codes. Well, I started working with uh, photographers, um, uh, makeup artists, and then we had to create, we had to imagine something which of course was visual and which was going to have an impact on uh, the uh, customers, on uh, people who would buy magazines, etc. And little by little, I started working in another world, the world of perfumes. One of my clients, in fact, asked me to uh, join her in an adventure that, again, focused on something that was very inventive. She'd, in fact, invented a small patch which you would uh, uh, stick uh, to advertising pages in magazines or send out uh, in um, uh, mail on mailing lists, and there was a little patch, and then you would unstick it, and underneath there would be some, a drop of perfume, and people could smell this scent. So it wasn't merely visual advertising, it was also calling or appealing to one's sense of scent. So this was a form of creation which took advertising one step further and boosted um, the sales of uh, perfume. So again, creative at the service of the product. So I uh, joined her in this adventure. We set up a, a business. We opened our first office in Los Angeles and then a second office in New York. And as, of course, uh, uh, when it comes to perfume, the center of the world is in Paris. And being both French and American, I opened an office in Paris. And uh, in two years, we managed to uh, uh, persuade all our colleagues in the perfume uh, business, and they became uh, uh, friends. And in particular, I'd like to mention Calvin Klein. But he, in fact, he didn't join us in this adventure. And uh, at the time, I was living between Los Angeles, New York, and Paris, and I had an office in each city. I used to spend about 10 days in each office. And one day, I came back from Los Angeles, um, uh, very tired, and I said, I, I, I feel something in my right uh, eye. It's as if uh, uh, my vision is blurry, as if I have a curtain over one eye. So I went to see an ophthalmologist in Los Angeles, and I arrived, and I honestly thought that I would simply be given glasses. And the ophthalmologist said to me, well, you're suffering from a viral uh, infection, which is called cytomegalovirus, the CMV. And I'm very sorry to inform you, but unfortunately, this is going to make you go blind within the coming year. And um, subsequently, this virus, no doubt, might uh, migrate to the brain and kill you. So at uh, 32 years of age, I was told that I was going to go blind and I was most likely going to die from this. So the American dream I had, uh, which I was in fact succeeding to a certain extent, I had this beautiful villa on the hillsides in Los Angeles, an apartment in New York, an apartment in Paris. Well, all of that just crumbled. And 
Then you ask yourself all sorts of questions. Why me? I've always uh, tried uh, to lead a good life, a healthy life, to be a good person. And then, of course, there are decisions which need to be taken. What do I do? I'm going to. Am I going to stop everything? Am I merely going to just wait and see what happens? Or, and, or and am I just going to sit back and wait for the end of my life? Or, on the contrary, another solution will be to uh, fight, to refuse to become a victim. But on the contrary, to be a player, a full actor within my own life, to play an active part. And that's what I opted for. The next day, I went to hospital. Um, I had a, a drip uh, installed for chemotherapy, two hours a day. I was told, in fact, that there's a way of doing this. I could do it myself uh, with uh, mini pumps, which one could, in fact, carry and attach to oneself and just do this, administer this drug anywhere. So I said, very well, this is the solution. I don't want to be blocked in hospital rooms. I want to do this myself. So I took that decision. I took that decision to continue and continue working. I liked my work and I couldn't imagine doing anything else. And just to accept being a victim was not an option for me. So I continued to work, to travel. I did my chemotherapy in planes, in offices, um, everywhere I could, discreetly, because needless to say, I didn't want to alarm the people around me. And then our company was being taken over by a large American group, and one of the preconditions for me was that that I go to work for that large group in New York. Uh, the CEO of my firm said to me, well, Eric, because I'd explained to her what was happening, didn't uh, uh, say anything and continued as if uh, everything was all right, because, in fact, uh, I really wanted to leave with the fruit of my work. And so I said, all right, let's just keep this quiet. Let's keep it secret. It's not necessarily the best thing, but that's what we'll do. I had also bought a villa uh, in Los Angeles. I had decided to renovate that house, and I decided, therefore, to continue with that project and uh, to continue with my plans and to find the adequate people to do this. And slowly and gradually, I became weaker. I went blind in one eye, but I continued nonetheless to work. And then on the 5th of November, I had just turned 33 years of age. And then my second eye, I lost the sight in my second eye. The firm was sold. I had to stop working because I could no longer see. So the firm was uh, sold. And that was it, at least for by. Uh, for my uh, for the CEO, that was mission accomplished, and for me, no job anymore. I couldn't continue, and again, I started doing this work in my home. I had to finish that, and of course, uh, as I couldn't work any longer, and I hadn't been involved in the uh, sale of the company, my own struggle was different. I was struggling against death, so I found myself with no job. This renovation in the house, invoices piling up because. Because as you can imagine, in the USA, even if you have a good insurance coverage, the medical bills are extremely costly. So it's uh, not because uh, you've been told that uh, you're going to die, that invoices stop uh, coming in. So I uh, took a decision. I decided to finish renovating my home, to put it on the market in order to be able to sell it, to obtain money, in order to be able to continue treating my illness, to fight against the illness. So I had to retake possession of the house, how could I do that uh, when I could no longer see it? So I had to touch it. That's the first thing I did. I started touching the walls, find the walls, touching the walls. I walked around doing that, uh, trying to avoid risks and dangers. And I started realizing several things. First of all, that the materials had different uh, textures, different uh, uh, feelings in terms of uh, cold and warmth. I started seeing through my 
my fingers, things that I hadn't necessarily seen with my eyes. And little by little, I rediscovered my house in that way. And I discovered slowly and gradually some very interesting things through the textures, certain textures, in fact, which uh, take in the warmth of the day, of the sun, etc., for others. In fact, uh, certain materials resonate with other materials. So that was my first discovery. And the second discovery, in fact, was with sounds, because at one point, of course, I had to uh, move away from the walls and go into the room. So then I asked myself, well, what can I do in order to feel what is around me, the volumes, the materials being used or to be used? And I started clapping like that. And you heard, when I do that, there are echoes. These echoes, in fact, reverberate and depends on the size of the room or it depends on the surrounding materials in the room. And those became essential elements for me in order to be able to visualize my surrounding uh, the, the space. And that was my second discovery. And again, in connection with sounds, another thing I started to do was to listen. When you are somewhere and you listen, you hear all sorts of things. And then what I heard were sounds like the, the sound of the fridge, of uh, the pipes, of uh, uh, the cars uh, passing uh, uh, along the road, or of the swimming pool. And those sounds became cardinal points in the house. And a fourth thing I discovered as well was through scents or smells. And there are all sorts of scents or smells in a house. You don't always become aware of them, such as the smell of the chimney, of the kitchen, of the bathroom, or uh, certain materials such as wooden flooring, a leather couch, um, dyes in some of the um, textures, the curtains, the um, carpeting. And those became cardinal points as well for me in order to be able to find my bearings in the house. And I started really retaking possession of my home. Something else I discovered was energy. I would go into a room, uh, a room, in fact, that had never really been uh, properly furnished because I didn't really feel at home. And then when I was blind, I realized what was missing. It was something, uh, an opening. There was a wall, in fact, which uh, was on the side of the house and I decided I needed to open it up and after having uh, checked what was outside I realized in fact that I could easily install windows I did that they were built and I realized that it was as if uh, energy came flowing into this room as if all of a sudden I could breathe freely once again and uh, uh, later on when I became more familiar with feng shui rules etc and uh, uh, the Chinese teachings in that connection, I realized, in fact, what had happened. There was a new balance which had been struck amongst all the elements. And I started feeling much better in that room. And I realized, in fact, it hit me that energy is everywhere. We live from this energy. And again, here in uh, Agur, you work with energy, you work on electricity. But ele electricity is only one single form of energy. There's energy all around us. And therefore, why can't we also understand that there's energy in our own environment that we need to understand, uh, to, to grasp, and that you can redirect just as you would with an electrical current. So, I uh, wanted to measure uh, uh, my space. The Vitruvian man of Leonardo da Vinci showed us uh, with his images that uh, a man is almost a perfect being in our uh, body. I'm one meter uh, 83, uh, six foot high. And when I open my hands, I can start measuring the spaces around me. I put my fingers. Uh, 
against the wall, and then uh, six uh, feet uh, allows me to measure the space when I stretch my arms out. And uh, then when I uh, bend my arm, I realize that we're only talking about three feet, etc. And it gives me a notion of uh, an understanding of the surrounding area. I can measure space in that way. And my environment, therefore, takes on this human dimension. It's very important because in a house, people uh, live in this human environment. And suddenly, uh, I could understand the usefulness of measuring the area and space with my own body. I am now able to imagine the room visually by measuring it in that way. But you might say to me, well, of course, when you renovate a, a home, a house, you want to uh, add colors. And colors are very interesting because, in fact, they also are different types of energy. There are energies which are beneficial for us, colors which are good for us, like energies which are good for us. And uh, colors are a little bit like vitamins. Certain colors are good for us. Others, on the other hand, disturb us. And I remember that at that point in time, I had uh, seen a doctor in Chinese medicine, and he gave me herbs in order to, uh, in fact, get rid of the toxins uh, which came from all the drugs I was taking because of chemo therapy and he used to give me these herbs and he would ask me to stretch out my arm and uh, to uh, resist as much as possible he would push my arm towards the ground and certain herbs gave me greater strength than others a little bit like en uh, electricity these are energies in fact which supplement one another and uh, they can confer this strength and I thought to myself well why don't I try this uh, tactic with uh, samples of different colors and somebody gave me some samples and we carried out we tried the same technique and one color gave me more strength than another one and I asked well what is this color and they answered well it's a kind of orange, a kind of a burnt orange. And what was interesting was that this is, is a color I had always been drawn to in the past. I had some uh, articles, some clothes uh, in that color, or it, I had used it already in my uh, interior decoration, and I really liked it. It was good for me. So I said, well, why not? Why don't I uh, understand and use colors in this positive way in my environment? And this will feed me just like vitamins, like when you take vitamins, you're not going to swallow a whole pillbox, and you're not obviously going to paint your whole house in burnt orange, so you need to, to dose this properly. And then with all these elements, I decided that I would be able to finish this house myself in, uh, in order to be able to put it onto the market, sell it, pay my bills, and have enough money uh, before me. My health was improving. Now I am blind, but um, my immune system was picking up and was starting to fight the virus. And it looked like I might actually win the battle against the disease. So that was one positive aspect because uh, by remaining active, by doing things, I think that uh, this sends a signal to our bodies and it helps them carry on, carry on the fight. But something interesting happens when you're told at the age of 33 that uh, you're likely to die. You ask yourself why, and you ask yourself if you've done everything you wanted to in life. This was very important to me, and I told myself, I can't die yet because I haven't yet achieved everything I wanted to achieve in my life. And this was a very profound feeling. You start to understand a lot of things. You understand why people wanted to leave buildings bearing their names when they died, because they told themselves, maybe I will be forgotten, but the buildings will still stand, and it will remind people that I existed. But that wasn't what was important for me. I told myself that I wanted to achieve something in my life that was bigger than myself. So that really helped me in my fight. It helped me to carry on when I told myself uh, there needs to be more. I needed to fight because there was something I had yet to achieve in my life. So I carried on. 
And by using all these elements, I finished the house and I put it on the market. And what I noticed is when people came to visit the house, I mean, estate agents, first of all, and everybody told me that you know the market was quite depressed at, in the United States and California, and uh, they said the asking price was too high. And I told them I needed the money, I needed to pay my bills, and I, I believed in it. For me, it was obvious. But um, after we discussed the price, people told me that they felt really well in my house. They said they didn't want to leave anymore. And I always used to work in the visual field in advertising, advertising campaigns for perfume, and I was always using a visual vocabulary. Um, I was dealing with beauty. But now people are talking about well-being, a feeling of well-being. And I thought, hang on. We're changing the terms of the debate, and this was a revelation for me. The most important thing in a house is how it makes you feel, a feeling of well-being. So what I'd created was a place where people feel good. It's not a, a place based on, on, on visual aspects like beauty, but a place based on the harmony of all the other senses. So I, I sold this house very quickly and for the price I asked. This was a, a great success, and it also helped me mentally. It helped me to fight the virus. And at that point, my doctor told me that the virus was no longer active in my body. It was no longer detectable. And that was wonderful news. But then I no longer had a house, I no longer had a job, I had to carry on, I'd lost my sight, what was I going to do? And once again, I dared, I made a decision, I told myself, right, I paid my bills, I have a little bit of money to live on, why not carry on doing what I just did, buy a house, renovate it, and sell it? So I built, uh, I bought a smaller house, a slightly cheaper house. It was in a very bad condition, and I renovated it. I used all the discoveries I'd made. I harnessed these uh, criteria, these sensory criteria, these techniques I'd discovered working through the senses to achieve a visual effect. So I renovated the house, put it on the market, and I sold it on the first day. We had something like an auction. This is something that you can't do in France, but which you can do in the state. People overbid. They bid a higher price than the, the asking price for the house. And it was pretty incredible for me. So I sold this house. I did the same with yet another house, and there I, it was even better. I had seven office people wrote letters to me saying, please, this is my dream home. So once again, I was able to sell this house. And at that point, uh, well, the, the press took an interest because they like unusual stories, and uh, I was asked to do interviews and that sort of thing. And I think that's when I realized that I had created something very unusual. Because you wouldn't think that somebody who was completely blind would be able to engage in such a visual activity as interior design. And I think that was the, the first moment when I really asked myself what had happened. I mean, I was in survival mode up to that point. But then when you have a little bit of time and a little bit of money set aside, you can settle down and start thinking about what just happened. This wasn't something that I had planned. It just happened. I never set out telling myself, OK, now that I'm blind, I'm going to decorate houses. That was never the plan. So what happened? At the end of the day, 
Creativity is something that comes from inside you. It's not something that's dependent on your sight. It's something very profound. And for me, it was based on emotions, on needs, on a need to feel at home in your home, to be in harmony with all your senses. And since I'd had a very visual activity in my past, I also wanted to create a space that is pleasant to look at. But there was a sort of inversion of values. The visual aspect, which had always been primary for me, because uh, that was what I was working towards in my job, it became the last aspect I took into account in my activity. So everything was turned upside down. And at that point, I realized that what we all needed, because interior design is also a need, you, you need to live in a space that is pleasant, that is practical, that meets your needs, that uh, matches your lifestyle. So what I realized at that point is that I was really coming back to the basics. It's as if I was constructing a, a, a human being. A house is like a human being, and you, you start with the inside, the rooms inside, and then the physical appearance is the finishing touch. And people were interested. They come and told us, we, we love what you do, but uh, we're not here to buy a house. But we, we would like somebody to help us redesign a house, redecorate. And I realized that there was a demand out there. There were people who came to me for advice on how to, to make their home more homelike so they could feel better. Because, you know, coming to a, a blind interior designer and ask for something visual, um, you need to have understood something. You need to have understood that creativity comes from a much deeper place. It's not about fashion. It's not about trends. It's not about which color is currently fashionable. It's, it's really something fundamental, something that comes from deep inside you. And in that process, I realized that my job was also to understand these people, to understand their lives, their needs, to understand how they lived how they lived inside their home. So in a way, I almost become my client's analyst. I ask them many questions. I spend time with them. And that's how I start to understand why they turn to me. I'll give you an example. Somebody came to me who was a professional hockey player. That's all I knew. And he wanted me to redecorate his house. So I go to his home and I feel that there's a lack of positive energy. You really didn't feel well in that house. And so as I walked around the place, I, I touched surfaces, I touched the shelves, and uh, I felt that there were a lot of photos, a lot of trophies, things of that kind. So I talked to the client. He told me, I used to be a hockey player. I had a wonderful career in the United States, but uh, what happened is that I had an accident. My knee was injured and my career was over, overnight. So I asked him what he did currently, and he said, well, I'm struggling. Uh, my, my marriage is suffering. Um, I'm having trouble communicating with my daughter. And I began to, to understand what was going on within that family and why they turned to me. They wanted to redecorate, to change their living environment. But this is something very profound. They wanted to improve their lives. Maybe they didn't really realize the impact that our living space can have on us. So I asked this, this gentleman, is there a place where you can go to forget everything, where you can just be yourself and feel good? And he said, yes, I really like Hawaii. I feel, I feel great in Hawaii. Hawaii makes me forget everything. It's the place when I feel, where I feel really good. 
And that gave me a whole range of, of sensory input, smells, textures, colors, a whole different energy, all these elements that you find in Hawaii. And that really made the job easier for me since I, I knew what to work towards. I, I knew what textures, what colors to use, what scents, what types of energy. So I harnessed all that and I created this whole new atmosphere for him. But I still had one problem. His past was still there, the trophies were still there, and he wasn't going to put them in storage. So what I did, I created a large table which I situated behind his sofa, and that's where I put all his trophies, behind the sofa on the table. So when he's sitting on the couch, his past is behind him, where it should be. And he is in this environment where he feels well. I use lots, lots of exotic woods, bamboo, with, with very specific textures and colors that you find in Hawaii, but also smell. And the client was delighted. So was his wife. And he, he wrote me a beautiful letter three months later, thanking me because uh, their lives had changed. He'd embarked on a new career in finance. We were on the brink of divorce with my wife, but we got together again. My, my daughter's doing much better at school. And there I realized that by changing our living environment, it's like a domino effect. You create something that has an impact, a much wider impact than merely decoration. It also has an impact on the people who live in these environments. So for me, creativity is something that goes beyond all the codes and the, the trends. For me, creativity is something that must come from deep inside. It must have meaning. You can't just go and create something. For instance, we were talking about chairs. Chairs have a purpose. Their purpose is to be sat on. If we create a chair that is more like a sculpture, then you've, you've missed your goal. You've failed. For me, as a, as a designer, if I created universes where people feel uncomfortable, where people feel like they're in the showroom, where they don't feel at home, where they don't feel nourished, then I would have failed. What is important in, in a creative job is to focus on what you're doing and why you're doing it, and also to go beyond that. To always remember that anything is possible, but you're creating for a purpose, and you must never lose sight of that purpose. Sometimes I have clients who come to me and say, right, we asked this or that very famous designer, and now uh, our home is very beautiful, but it doesn't really fit our lives. We don't feel at home in that space. So what does that tell me? It tells me that in, in a creative job, there's a, a through line. It's all about well-being. If you, you create an interior decor, it's not a film set. It needs to be a living environment for the client to help them to do better than something they would come up with themselves, to, to help them because you have certain skills which they don't have. But they will also feed your creativity. Because uh, you, you can't work in isolation, which is why today I work with a team, and uh, my team feed me with their ideas, their input. For instance, my workmen, they taught me everything I know. I used to spend a lot of time on my renovation sites, and. Uh, the input from my carpenters, my electricians, 
the people who did the floors. All these craftsmen taught me what I know about what is possible and what isn't. And of course, I, I challenged them. And we, we achieved these challenges together. And since I don't have my sight, maybe uh, I said myself impossible goals, goals, but we achieved them together. So what am I trying to say today? For me, creation is to close my eyes, to imagine the unimaginable, and to create these things together with my team. So we, we pool our skills and try to achieve something useful, something good, something which improves our lives and which makes you feel good. That is the goal of creativity. If you create something, you want it to have a positive impact on people's well-being. So I think I've achieved my dream. I've answered the question I asked myself when I was diagnosed. Why was this happening to me? And I think it, it happened to enable me to to discover these things I've told you about today. So I can be here and share this with you. It's wonderful. Of course, there are obstacles in life, there are challenges, sometimes defeats, but these can also be turned into opportunities. Earlier, Mr. Lasser was talking about these Chinese and Japanese words. In Chinese, the word obstacle is the same as the word for opportunity. Now, what does that teach us? Every obstacle can be an opportunity for learning. And that's what I, I love. Every day we have opportunities to learn, to create, and to share, as I'm doing today. Uh, to conclude, I would like to tell you one thing. In order to create better, I sincerely believe that you need to close your eyes and to allow your dreams to, to become visualized so that you can achieve them. So thank you very much, and I would be happy to take your questions. I think there's a lot we have to talk about. Thank you. Thank you.